Okay, I think it's all yours, Dan. All right, thank you very much. Sorry for the delay this morning. Um, I, I do run a asynchronous messaging service, right? Um, so a little history before I start off here. I gotta probably hide this thing. You can perhaps see that. A uh, little history about uh, my background and about uh, the team's background here at Service Bus, uh, which is the team I'm on now, um, is that uh, this should be interesting for most people on this call, is that the original Service Bus engineering team was uh, largely from uh, the BizTalk uh, engineering team. Uh, so at least the messaging side, the core messaging engine side of BizTalk. And uh, that sort of tradition continues quite a bit today. And uh, the same team actually also maintains uh, MSMQ, even still. I hadn't really realized that was still a thing until I uh, became responsible for it. And uh, what I want to talk about today is a little bit of the, uh, the background of Service Bus and the things really that kind of caught me off guard and that I, I really was surprised by uh, when I started being a PM for Service Bus. And uh, I, I really, I thought I knew messaging fairly well, and I, I still stand by that. Uh, BizTalk's a great messaging platform and taught me a lot about messaging. I've worked with Tibco, I've worked with MQ, um, M -M -M MSMQ, I'm trying to think of what else, uh, RabbitMQ. If it's a messaging platform, I've probably worked with it at some point. Um, and I was actually quite surprised to realize, though, that uh, I didn't know nearly as much about service bus as I thought I would. Uh, so I got here and I realized there are a whole lot of other features that Service Bus has that I never used. Um, and I don't know, maybe this isn't the case for the other people uh, on this call, but it's certainly something that had surprised me to see exactly how, how deep some of these features really are. So uh, I just want to go through the service, the service features of Azure Service Bus that really caught me by surprise and uh, really I think are, are worth discussing and sharing. And I have samples for all of these that I'll put up on my GitHub and uh, uh, the rest of this will just be walking through sort of five aspects of each of these uh, features in Service Bus that, or Service Bus messaging that I think are worth highlighting. The first one being duplicate detection. Um, I'm really surprised that I, I didn't realize that the service had this before. Um, and so this is, you know, simple at a high level uh, is being able to ignore messages that are sent more than one time in a specified time window. Uh, this actually comes into play all the time for integration. Uh, systems you know for for integration design so you might have upstream applications that are unpredictable or they're noisy uh, they may send duplicate messages by the nature of their protocol because they're trying to make sure things are received um, i know the co the common one that i always see that always irks me every time is a website that that tells you not to click you know the buy button again or the, the submit button again so you don't get charged multiple times um, that's you know uh, that's terrible uh, and this is actually a really easy way to, to do this in, in Service Bus. And all you have to do is uh, turn use the message ID property of any message and you get this feature for free. Um, you don't actually even pay anything extra for it, oddly enough. Uh, so when you create a queue or topic, you set this behavior uh, at the queue description or uh, subscription, or the queue description or topic description. Uh, you can set it through the portal or you can set it uh, through code. And uh, this really is a pretty powerful thing. I mean, I know it's really simple, but when you talk about like cloud scale applications, and how you make reliable uh, integrations and reliable sort of eventual consistency models, uh, you really always run into the issue of idempotency. You want, you know, messages or, or, or methods that are called multiple times to not have negative effects. So uh, that's a great theory. It's a great thing to talk about. Uh, it tends to be a fairly hard thing to do. And this is uh, a very easy way to do it. So I think this will jump my screen over for me. If we go look at from a code standpoint, uh, what this looks like, uh, this one's pretty easy. So let's see, I actually, I won't spend too much time on code here since I'm late. Uh, but really, all you have to do when you're creating one of these uh, queues, let's go look at my setup entities here, is I actually just use create queue. Uh, I set requires duplicate detection to, to true, and then I set a time window for duplicate detection history, and this window can be very large. Uh, so after this, whenever you send a message, uh, that message coming through is just going to uh, 
uh, use an ID property of the message. This could be something from your actual business classes. It could be something like a session ID or an order ID. And importantly, it's, you know, it's supposed to be something that you generate on your client side and that you'll have and, and be able to know that you're not sending more than one time. So this is my first favorite feature that I saw. I, I was pretty impressed by this. Um, and like most of these features, you know, I guess this is my problem now. Um, the, the documentation and samples weren't quite as accessible as they probably need to be. Um, the next one is scheduled messages. So I like this one a lot too. So uh, all, all messaging systems, all middleware is really about communication of, of services and functionality that may not uh, you know, be online at the same time. Uh, this is really what messaging is all about is, is decoupling. And time, uh, temporal coupling, is actually one of the most complicated uh, coupling structures that happens frequently. So scheduled messages is a very simple way to uh, enable a client to reliably and safely put a message into a, an entity, and it won't actually appear for anyone to read until the specified future time. So uh, this is, a, again, a very simple uh, capability, but it lights up a whole lot of uh, rich things that you can implement with it. So some of these are going to be things like, uh, you know, being able to do a cancellation. So for instance, if you have some action that you're, you're waiting on like a, a human response or an email or something, uh, this could almost be like a delay shape in, uh, in an orchestration. Uh, you can actually express that type of functionality with this. Uh, and you can do other things as well. You know, you can, you can do things like trigger a process, like an end of day process by enqueuing a command message that's not going to show up into the queue so none of your downstream readers will read it or even see it until that time happens. Um, you know, in MSMQ, you got something like this, but it was the responsibility of the client to, to know the TTLs and know the, the pieces like this. But here, you know, we put this in the service and it's just yours to use. And uh, you don't even need to change anything in an entity for this one, actually. Um, so I actually reused my same send order uh, function when I wrote a little sample for this, and all you do is set the schedule and queue, scheduled and queue time UTC to the time that you want to send your message at, and it just appears in the queue at that time. Um, interestingly, this and a few of the other features we'll talk about, they will affect your your message counts uh, or your message your your queue sizes or topic sizes. Um, so the messages are there, you know, they exist. Uh, they're just not there to be read yet. This one, this one I had no idea about. This one's actually really cool, defer. Defer is a pretty slick feature. Um, whenever you look at something like a queue or topic, especially if you're doing in-order processing, um, you know, the, the problem with those is they're trans if you're using transactionality in there, <clears throat> when you read a message off the queue, you're really reading the first message on the queue. So if you have a message you're not capable of processing, uh, this sort of presents a problem for you. Um, so you, you know, you get stuck in having to do all these hoops jumping through when you're going to actually go save the message somewhere else or renew locks or something like that. So no one else takes it. Uh, so defer is a capability to make a message basically disappear off of an entity, um, so that no one else will read it. It's still there and it's still safe. Um, but you know, it's not there, uh, standing in the way of any other processing that's going to happen. So when is this useful? Uh, this is really useful whenever you can't process something immediately, but you need to process it. And it's important. It's something you can't lose. Because uh, if you do something like pull a message off and, you know, act or complete the message and you need to go do something in the future, well, if you have a failure or a crash in that time, there's a high likelihood that you're going to lose that message. Um, you could do things like send it to another queue or do you know, other things that, you know, you just end up with sort of bloating your messaging uh, topology and getting more and more stuff in there. Um, an important aspect for this is that there, there are a few things you could do here that are pretty slick. Uh, one is that not everything's going to arrive necessarily in the order in which you expect it. So, uh, you know, in BizTalk, we would have done like a convoy uh, for a lot of this stuff. Uh, but, you know, if you need something like a resequencing aggregator, this is totally a good option. Uh, so this is... Uh, a, a very you know simple way to do this and uh, it's really simple to use when you receive a brokered message you just call the defer method on it um, the really really important uh, key piece to keep in mind here is you need to save the sequence number 
because once you do this, it's the only way back. Um, and this really lets you do a lot of rich things like providing logical order rather than, you know, the order in which messages were sent um, for dealing with chaotic senders for all kinds of things. And if we go look at what defer looks like, I've got a simple defer sample here. Um, all these look the same, all these samples. So for defer, what I'm going to do is use the same existing queue on there because there's nothing there. There's nothing that's different. These are all the same. Um, and like I'd said, you have to keep track of your defer list, so of the sequence numbers. Every brokered message has a sequence number. And so what I'm doing here is I'm actually sending an order, and I'm adding a property of type. Uh, and then I'm sending a command, and I'm adding a, a, a property of type that says stop command, you know, rather than place order. And then I'm sending another order. Uh, if I weren't using defer, I would have to read this message before I can go on to the next message. So before I can go on to the second order. And then all this code does is go and read uh, the messages off of here. And you can see I'm checking if the type is stop command, then I want to defer the message. And if it's not, I want to uh, complete the message. And finally, the last piece here, what I'm going to do is, is iterate over my defer list and go and receive those specific messages from the defer. So this actually uh, is where you might have seen this at some points, uh, the receive method in our SDK uh, taking a sequence number, a long sequence number. Uh, so that is receive this exact message. Um, so this is pretty useful here. If I go uncomment my defer sample, it will actually go and run this. And it'll write out to me some stuff that it's doing. And I can see that I've placed an order, I've deferred a command, and then I've placed an order. Um, and now uh, I can actually, so that was the first part of this loop that we looked at, which was up to here. And now I can actually go through and receive my other messages. If I go look in my portal right now, I'll actually see, I'm trying to see which of these is actually the the window I want to look at, not the window that I'm working on other stuff with other people for. Oh, integration Monday. So if I go look in here, oh, I'm clicking all over the place. I should just use Service Bus Explorer. I'll actually see that this queue actually has a, uh, a one message in there. And if I hit enter here, it's going to go receive that out of there and now if i refresh here i will have that message be gone and actually after this i'm going to switch to uh service bus explorer because it's just gonna be faster okay i'm an impatient man so i'm switching to service bus explorer right now And I can see that it's empty, so I've actually read that message off. So if I come back here, quit out of my samples, go back into Visual Studio, and look at our next sample. Oh, you know what? I guess I'll do that in here. So the first cool. Um, <laughs> there is a big warning, though. Um, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble with defer. That sequence number is really, really important. Uh, if you uh, lose it, uh, there's no other way to get the message. So, you know, consider yourself warned there. Uh, you know, you might want to save those in a very special place. I don't know. Uh, if, you, if you do this too often, if you do this recklessly, you'll bloat the size of your cues and topics. So this is a problem. Here's one of my other favorites. And I actually didn't really know much about this one when I started. Let's see. Yes, the queue will grow forever. Um, now, the expiration times still work on the queue. So the message will... You know what? I think I think the message will still expire when the queue expiration time hits. Which, by the way, I'm glad someone brought that up because we're thinking about changing that. There is no like real default value on older queues right now or in topics, and we want there to be a default. Actually, my last point will be a good one for that, or second to last. So another one that I like also, auto forward. Auto forward is pretty slick, um, and I actually have to admit I didn't really know about this one before I started working on the product. Uh, so, you know, this is just a way to forward a message between entities. 
automatically on the server side. Uh, so if you uh, have senders, current senders that are sending to an address and you don't want them to send there anymore, uh, but you can't really change them, or maybe you've created a bunch of individual queues or something because you want to have more fine-grained control so that you don't have a lot of senders you know, that should have different identities sending the same place, but you want the semantics of like a single queue or of topics, but you don't get that out of the security that particularly right now in SAS, you can't get uh, on a queue level. So this is a way to do that. Um, you know, changing, why do you want to do that? Because getting other people to change is really, really hard. You know, changing stuff yourself is hard, getting other people to change, and God, I didn't know how serious this was until I worked on this team. Yeah, getting other people to change stuff could be impossible. You know, we cannot just go out and say, hey, you know what, we're going to change the semantics of our queues, good luck. Um, so we need to be, you know, sort of backwards compatible, and this is a way that you can as well. So this is easy. You just set the forward to property on the queue uh, or on the subscription if it's a topic. Um, and this is cool because it lets you, you know, change your mind later on. Queues and topics. Ah, there's a question about auto forwarding to multiple queues and topics. Ah, so why is auto forward so cool? So no, you can only auto forward to one entity. But let's say you received a message on a queue. You can auto forward from a queue to a topic. And within that topic, you can send to a bunch of other places. So you can really start to stitch through auto forward you can start to stitch together a lot of stuff. You can daisy chain um, some pretty complex topologies. Uh, so a code sample for this one, let's see, my auto forward code, this code sample. This one's fairly light. Let's see, shrink some of these down. Defer, that's still my favorite one. Okay, so auto forward. So let's go look at what some auto forward entities look like. This is real easy. It is literally just one property on the queue. Here I'm creating a new queue, which I'm going to call old queue. Old queue is the queue I don't want to read from anymore. You know, I, I want to give people separate queues. Um, and the sample is really simple. I just write to, I won't even bother running this one because we are running a little bit short on time. I just write to the old queue. You can see I've called it forwarded queue. That's, that's this old queue I created. Um, and I read from the new queue. Uh, there is an interesting piece here, you know, I may as well run this. Um, and that is that once you enable this on an entity, you can't connect to that entity anymore. So this is a server side, the service knows what's going on. And you'll see I have, I'm sending to this old queue. Let's take a second, I'm creating a queue, okay. And you can see I've actually changed the name of the customer here before I sent to the forwarded queue. And then I'm reading from the original queue. Uh, so once you've set this feature on a queue, you can't connect to that queue and read out of it anymore. So you can see here that I have auto forwarding on. So I have forward to to another queue. Um, so yeah, if you try to connect, you'll actually get a very clear error that says, hey, you can't read from these because you've got auto forwarding on it. So that one's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that feature. And the reason I'm happy about it is that you can change your mind about something and not have it be the end of the world. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more about topologies and about uh, you know messaging topologies. This one I'm actually a little uh, embarrassed to admit. I did not really know much about actions on subscriptions. Uh, I knew a lot about subscriptions. I've been working with MQ, I'm real familiar with uh, with subscriptions and with pub sub of this nature. And actually, of you know, I think BizTalk has a very similar. Uh, model for filters and subscriptions that, that I think make it very easy to understand how that works. Um, what I didn't realize is that with Service Bus, you can actually change message properties when a subscription receives a message. Uh, so not only can you daisy chain things together and make a big graph, which in and of itself is pretty impressive, at points along that graph, you can actually change properties as they go. So now you can start to use user properties or system properties. <laughs> nice, nice comment. Um, the, uh, you can start to use uh, system properties or user properties to start to express a decision tree with uh, actions that change state. So this is almost like what you could do with BRE. Not quite. I mean, and you know, you might not want to go uh, too far 
with this, you could get yourself into a whole lot of trouble. Um, and how we use this is using the action property of the rule description. Um, I can show this to you yeah, in code and in, uh, look at it in code and we'll look at it in Service Bus Explorer, which is, yes, still my favorite tool to work with Service Bus on. So from a code standpoint, this one's also fairly easy. All the work here is on the setup and on nothing else really. Uh, so if we come in here and look at this, subscriptions on actions. So if I create a topic um, and I put a subscription on that topic, uh, and then I'm going to come here and delete the rules because you know it's going to put in a, ooh, a link for Service Bus Explorer. Yeah, it's on GitHub. Um, You know what, I'll send that out at the end, actually. Um, I want to run through these pretty quick. So uh, I'm removing all the rules that are on there, because if you go create a, uh, a subscription on a topic, automatically you're going to get this default rule. Um, I think it's called like dollar sign default or something. And it's a one equals one. It's an always true rule. And that's usually not what you want. It's there for integrity reasons, I guess. But so what I'm doing here now is you can see I'm creating a new rule, my own rule. And the filter for the rule, which is the part we're all probably going to be fairly familiar with, is like the logical expression. So I'm saying, does a property exist called stage? Or does a property not exist called stage? And if that property doesn't exist, I'm performing an action. And you can see I have uh, a few other pieces that I can put on this. So I get uh, action. I can get uh, a, a few other things I can change on a rule description. But the two most important are these two. And here, I'm actually setting that property of stage to one. So when this message comes back through this queue or another one or this topic or another one, it'll already have that set. Uh, now, you can't auto forward to uh, yourself. So you can't, you know, you can't, uh, an entity can't auto forward, this, this subscription can't auto forward back to this topic, um, which is probably a good thing. Uh, but it can auto forward to another one. So if you had two topics alone, just two topics, you can pile rules on them and forward between them and uh, start to you know set a lot of properties this way and do a lot of rich stuff. So when you go look at what this looks like, in service, oh, you know what? I'll have to create this. Okay, time to run this sample. Okay, and you can see, if I go look at the code for this now, what actually happened after the setup, um, I'm sending to this actions topic. Uh, and then I'm just going to go read from that actual topic. I'm not doing anything really fancy here. I think the, the concept it's on its own is enough. But I am writing out uh, the, the stage, so the property called stage, which I never set. You can see right here, I never set a property called stage, but I get one on here because of the auto for because of the action on the subscription. So if I go look at this in Service Bus Explorer now, I can refresh my topics. I see an actions topic. I see my subscription called stage one. And in it I see rules. And that rule called default has a filter for the left and an action on the right. And so I can change these in here. I can change them in code. Um, personally, I kind of like Service Bus Explorer, so that's the that's my guide for functionality that I want to put into our next uh, uh, Portal V Next UI. Okay, let's look at anything else on there. Okay, so last warning on that. I gave you a warning on defer. Um, keep in mind, like especially with the tooling the way it is right now, and the fact that you know there is no rich management stuff that you're getting from a platform like BizTalk. Uh, you know, you might not want to do all their application logic through this sort of uh, method. There was a question about these features being in uh, the service bus for Windows Server. Um, many of them are. I don't remember exactly which ones are. Not all of them are. Uh, so this is, you know, this is part of our issue that we ship our, our Azure service. We, we patch it all the time and do big releases about every two weeks. Actually, it's exactly every two weeks. So we're free to add these sorts of things. 
um, with the package product, it's a lot more difficult. Dead lettering with auto forward. This one's kind of cool too. So, um, imagine that you want to send dead, dead lettering messages. Um, you know, this is something I'm not sure if there's a good analogy necessarily in BizTalk for, but when you use something like MSMQ or MQ series, a dead letter is really a place that you put things that you couldn't read out of a queue. Um, and that could be for a lot of reasons. It could be like a serialization error. It could be something else, maybe a downstream system not being available. But the concept is messages that cannot be processed end up in a dead letter. Uh, queues and topics both support dead lettering. Um, and they support two different kinds of dead lettering. Uh, one is based on, let's see, this might be worth showing off, is based on the uh, read count, like how many times a message has been read. And the other is based on uh, expiration, so TTL of the message. So you can do either. Uh, by default, the read count is on, and it's at 10. I'm pretty sure that's the default on Azure. Uh, so if you try to read a message 10 times and don't complete it, uh, or abandon the, the, you know, the, the lock for the message, it'll end up in the dead letter queue. Uh, dead letter, yeah, entity part of the queue. So that is so that it doesn't block your processing. So you don't get, if, if you didn't pop that off into dead lettering, you get what's called a poison message. And a poison message is gonna just sit there and fail every time you read it. And eventually it's gonna, you know, basically DDoS you. Because if you get a few of them, they'll just keep getting read and keep wasting resources and not getting done. Now, I've mentioned <clears throat> two different ways that messages could dead letter through expiration or through some sort of downstream problem from the reader, uh, you might want more control over that. So, you know, just having one dead letter isn't necessarily good enough to express what you want to do. You might want to have a different process followed or a different message flow for things that had their uh, read count uh, exceeded and for things that had their expiration exceeded. So that's my why. Why would you want to do this? Not all messages fail for the same reasons. Um, and how you do this is by using the forward dead, letter, dead lettered messages to property on a queue uh, or on a subscription. And if we look at this from a code stand, standpoint, okay, so all you have to do here is when you create a queue, set these properties, set this property. This is really the, the key property. Uh, and it's the destination that you want to set this to. And you can actually see that I'm turning on the expiration one because this test is going to then go run um, and it's going to do a 10 second timeout. And if the message isn't received in 10 seconds, uh, it'll automatically go to the forwarded queue, which is called, you know, which is this duplicate queue value. And then I can go read from that queue and see the messages there. So if I go look at what that looks like here, I can see dead letter forward. And I can actually see, you would have seen from my other, my, my old queue that it used the forward to property and that this uses the forward dead letter messages to property. Ah, so does forward to have any filters? So forward to, in a way it can. One, you could just send to a topic and you could put as many topics as you want in there. Uh, two is if I go and look at a subscription, so here's a, the subscription we had in a previous sample. You can see I get both forward to and forward dead letter to in a subscription. So I can use filters in the rules for the subscriptions to say that these particular set of messages that match the subscription should go and be forwarded, uh, you know, only when they dead letter. So like they don't get forwarded for dead letter, but those subset that matches the filter goes and forwarded for dead letter. Um, and that's a pretty slick, pretty slick uh, control feature you get. And you can also see here actually in um, in Service Bus Management Council that you can do enable dead lettering on filter uh, evaluation error. I knew about this feature, that's why it's not in there. These are things I didn't know about. I, and so like I only knew about that one because of a very painful experience um, before coming to Microsoft. So it's a good one. I like that, you know, you can get really expressive here. All right, let's see, where are we now? <laughs> Auto delete on idle. Okay, this one's really cool. I don't even know if I have a sample for this one because it's that easy. So, entities uh, in your service bus subscriptions. Uh, you know, in a namespace, we have limits on how many things you can have. 
Um, and, you know, we actually have a whole lot of entities that people use that are or create that are unused. And we see that and, and we know it. And we're not exactly happy about it. Um, so we've built a feature, auto delete on idle, uh, which is unfortunately off by default, something we might want to talk about in the future. Um, but auto delete on idle enables you to delete entities automatically that haven't had a send operation uh, called on them for an amount of time that you dictate when you create the entity. Uh, this is, can be really useful. You know, if you need to create entities like queues or, or subscription or queues or, or topics for specific flows, for specific units of work, um, these are really kind of transient in nature. And, uh, you know, you should clean them up, but it's like, you know, getting the kids to clean up the rooms. Um, you should, doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, and more importantly, if you have a failure that caused your cleanup to fail, then what will happen is you'll start piling up entities. Um, so, you know, if you don't clean up your room, we'll do it for you. That's what this one lets you have. And all you have to do to turn this on is specify a time span for the auto delete on idle uh, property for a queue or topic. So that's either in the queue description or topic description. Do I have a sample for this one? No, I don't because it was that easy. Um, so, uh, yes, impact of this, I, I guess, you know, I'll send this deck out right after this. It's, I'm trying to break this down into five things that are interesting about this. What's the impact of this one? Hey, a clean namespace is a happy namespace, both for you and for me. Um, so, you know, this is something I, I would like to see more people use. And as I mentioned, might end up being something that we, you know, start to do all the time. You can see it here, um, in my screen, uh, in Service Bus Explorer that auto delete on idle is on. Uh, it is on, it's just a really, really, really big number that we're never gonna hit. Um, so, um, you know, it never ends up effectively doing anything. If you've played with uh, Google's PubSub at all, which is in a beta, and believe me, we are looking at uh, carefully, uh, they actually enforce auto delete on idle. So anything idle after 30 days is automatically deleted. So that's, that's good house cleaning actually. Okay, so now we're in the home stretch. So, okay, on message. This is relatively new to the SDK, um, new enough that it snuck past me. Um, and this, yeah, this is .NET client only, so I guess I'm cheating here a little bit. It's not really service bus specific. Uh, but this is really probably my single favorite feature of the, the .NET SDK for service bus. Uh, so what is it? It's a, it's a message pump that makes dispatching Yes, yes, exactly. No more polling. Uh, it's a message prompt that makes dispatching and processing messages really, really easy. So when should you use this? Personally, I think any time you're reading in Service Bus in .NET. So if you're reading from entities in Service Bus in .NET, I would use this. Um, this is a very modern approach. You know, we're making our clients, like my goal is to make the clients as easy to use the right way as possible. You know, there's a, there's a, well-known person in the cat team that says that you know we need to make it so that people fall into the pit of success you know uh, we have a, a lot of features in service bus as you've seen probably a bunch you didn't know about um, but you know some of them can be harder to use than they really probably should be and reading is one of them uh, so you know really you know yeah polling polling's a uh, yeah it's not my favorite way to do stuff uh, and if you look at something like event processor host if you've worked with event hubs at all these things are going to start to look really similar. And they actually use separate, uh, the same code, the same messaging pump te technology under the, under the hood. Um, so how do you use this? You set a Lambda or a function uh, callback on, uh, on message for the queue client or subs subscription client. And just to show you how easy this is, let's go look at oh, this one. Open. Okay, here we go. So, I'm going to create a queue client just like I have been this whole time. And all I do is set the lambda on this. So this can be anything. It can actually be a, a, a function pointer is what it fundamentally is, or, or you can just inline the code here if you want. Um, and so this is kind of cool. This just drops past this. So this code just starts. This is using the thread pool in the background. And, uh, you know, it's using tasks and dispatching tasks when messages come in. 
And so if I run the sample, what you'll see is unlike, uh, you know, the other samples I've shown using send and receive, please, please don't ever use send and receive. Always, always, always use async. I really should have done it in these um, because now I'm just adding to the problem that's the, probably the biggest problem I'm, of my life. Um, and so let's look at this right now. I'm going to run this. Uh, and this is a good question. Is, are these, uh, ah, yeah, two good questions. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get to both of those. Um, okay, so let me stop this. And let's take a look at our on message sample. So you'll see what that code promises to do is start a message pump and then send uh, five messages. So you can actually see here when this thing fires up that, uh, so this is interesting. You can see what's happened here is the, this samples complete, like read line thing that happens, right line and read line. That's actually happening on a separate thread right now. So you can see I actually received the first order before uh, that happened, and then I received the other four orders after. And if I run this again, it'll be in some other order uh, because they are happening on separate threads. And it's, uh, it is multi-threaded. It is a, a true message pump in here, uh, a dispatcher. And uh, then there are some questions about, like, how do you control that? Okay, so those are good questions. And the way you control this is with this on message options, which you pass in as a parameter to on message. Uh, Important features here are max concurrent calls. Max concurrent calls is going to be exactly what it sounds like. So you can actually get, uh, uh, you know, this will limit to how many times does on message get called concurrently. It's going to be five in this case. Um, and autocomplete. So this is if the messages are going to autocomplete. You could see from my previous sample here that I was calling message complete. So the default is that we're going to do a peak lock. And uh, this is going to do an autocomplete so that it, it uh, finishes the message automatically uh, in the end of that Lambda. Uh, so this runs the same way. Um, importantly to know, this is still using uh, our AMQP. Uh, I guess you could use this with SBMP uh, behind the background. So it's using our messaging protocol so that this isn't just calling receive every time. And even when you call receive, you're not necessarily calling receive all the time. Uh, what you're actually doing is your calling receive on the client. So our client, when you connect a messaging factory, has things like a prefetch size, um, and that is gonna uh, dictate how far ahead the actual, the actual client reads before you call receive. So just because you call receive doesn't mean you're actually gonna dish out to the service to call receive. And so this is pretty, uh, pretty good for this usage because on message is basically going to prime a pump here that's just going to keep running through this all the time. Um, and it's not calling receive all the way back to the service on every time, it's calling receive to the client. And if there's nothing there, the client is calling back on its own to the service. So this is the kind of direction that we're taking stuff. This stuff has all been, this is in before the 2.6, so this has been in the SDK for a while actually. Um, these are sort of my my top features of things I like. Uh, yeah, that's the end of my presentation here uh, of things that I really didn't know about. Um, you know, so the idea behind on message is that you're going to be able to do more with less. And I would actually say that that extends to really all of what we're trying to do with Service Bus. If you think about like Martin Fowler's whole thing about uh, microservices. He makes some really good points about uh, about uh, smart services and dumb pipes, and I'm all for dumb pipes, uh, but I'm also all for uh, you know separation of concerns. And messaging is one set of concerns that I think Service Bus really really addresses very well. Um, I've spent a lot of time doing uh, competitive analysis, and I'm totally confident in saying that Service Bus is the most sophisticated uh, cloud messaging platform in the world. Uh, and yeah, share the URL for the GitHub. Yeah, you bet. Um, I, I will send out to uh, Saravana right after this, the uh, my GitHub for this sample and the presentation will be up there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and uh, you can quote me on, on saying that it is the most sophisticated messaging platform in the world. It, it is. So uh, 
Yeah, there is a question about on-prem capabilities versus cloud. You know, I did kind of mention that that's a problem for us because we can't ship as fast uh, on-prem. And, uh, you know, we're trying to keep that as a faster cadence, but, you know, we don't really have a, a firm answer for that right now. Uh, I'm still looking for the best option to address that. And there's a question on duplicate messages if they're being dead lettered. Uh, no, they're actually just being ignored. Uh, so I don't think we even even persist them into the database. Let's see. I'm going to take a look at this chat window, see what other things are on here. Okay, so that is uh, what I wanted to cover today, primarily. Sorry to uh, come late and leave early, but it's lunchtime here in Redmond. And uh, I don't know if you have any other questions about these features. Anyone familiar with all of these features? Because I was really surprised, actually. And I guess while I'm on it, I'll mention that there is uh, there is a question about message sizes for Azure. Eh, 